Hello everybody, it's Kara from Wild Book Garden and today I'm here with the rest of the books that I read in January. Um, this is part two of my wrap-up. I will link part one down below and put all the content warnings for these books in the description and also any links and people I mention. So the next book I finished was The Innocence of Father Brown by G.K. Chesterton. This is the first, like this is a bind up of all of the Father Brown stories and I read like the first what was originally the first collection of them. And Father Brown is a Catholic priest in um, England, what year? Well, the first one was published in 1911, so it was probably around that time. Um, and he is very unassuming looking. People often underestimate him, but he's really, really brilliant. And he ends up solving, obviously, a lot of mysteries. And um, there are some recurring characters in some of these as well. And I'm really glad I finally started this series. Um, I really enjoyed this first collection. I find Father Brown a really interesting character and it's really like satisfying to see him just be so smart all the time and people just continually underestimate him and then he uh, kind of blows their mind. <laughs> um, I just find that very enjoyable and very interesting. I also find it interesting that because he is a priest and not a policeman or an, a private investigator or something, sometimes his idea of what justice is or what like the right outcome is is different and like seeing how he goes about that is very interesting. Um, I also really enjoyed Flambeau. He's a recurring character who I didn't expect to like that much um, but he was he's a really great character and I'm excited to see more of him um, and I also feel like this these stories for me had a good balance of like things that I was kind of starting to figure out or that I had an inkling about and then like surprising me with some of the solutions. I also really enjoyed G.K. Chesterton's writing. Um, I've read some nonfiction before from him that I have really enjoyed overall and this is my first fiction from him but I really like his writing in both. Um, on the negative side, pretty much just the of its time elements. Um, like there is a lot of racism and orientalism in some of the stories. I mean it kind of there's like a little bit of that like general ethnocentrism in a lot of these but the one that was especially bad was the wrong shape um just like lots of yeah racism and xenophobia and um yeah so those parts obviously were not enjoyable most of the stories didn't have nearly that much of it i just wanted to mention that one specifically so yeah really those aspects were the only things that i did not enjoy about these um i think some of my favorites or the stories that i found most interesting were the blue cross the flying stars the sign of the broken sword and the three tools of death um yeah so like there were some stories obviously that i didn't enjoy as much um a couple that i really didn't like but for the most part i did really like these and i gave the innocence of father brown four stars next i finished the first chill of autumn by w r gingell this is the third and final novella in the shards of a broken sword series um which are like you can read them as standalones but this book really does pull things i think together more like you actually see some of the characters from the other two um and this is the the, fi the finale. Um, our main character is Dion and she is the princess of this kingdom that is basically being like occupied and colonized by the Fae but nobody seems to notice or admit that that's what's happening um, and so it's about her kind of like coming into her power and figuring out what she can do about it to protect people. And this one I had really mixed feelings about. There's some things I liked. Um, I really enjoyed Dion as a main character. She just felt like such a believable mix of brave and afraid and strong but also like understandably worried about things and um, I just really enjoyed seeing how she like came to be more confident in herself and kind of uncovering the strength that she had had all along. I also overall really liked the directions the plot took that was very interesting and engaging um, with one exception that I'll get to in a minute and then I also really loved that we got to see Carmine again. Um, there's actually a short story featuring him in my copy that I haven't read yet but I'm excited to do that um, so it was really fun to see him again. But on the negative side the plot thing that I didn't really care for is and, th and I know that this is partly because of some things that have been happening over the last couple years, like in the real world, but I do wish there had been some kind of like acknowledgement that the Fae, who were bad, I'm not saying they're not bad, but they were taking advantage of something that is actually like a really good thing, um, which is like allowing refugees into <laughs> into your borders. Um, that's something I have strong feelings about and as I said that is very influenced by some things that have happened the last couple years so I don't think W.R. Gingell was like trying to say anything and I don't think like this is obviously in a fantasy context I understand it's different I just wanted to mention that that was one thing that I picked up on and it was um, I just think it could have been handled even with just a couple sentences but as for like the other things I didn't like I found 
Padrag, Patrak, I'm sorry for mispronouncing his name. Um, I found him really annoying. <laughs> I did not like him very much. Like he had a couple of moments that he was, that I liked him more, but overall he was probably one of my least favorite characters. And that's unfortunate because <laughs> he's in this quite a bit and a good chunk of the story, the response to that kind of depends on you really liking him or really caring about him and I didn't. <laughs> so that whole part of the book didn't really work for me. And also just some of the other characters I wasn't the biggest fan of either. Like I said, we do see some characters from the other novellas which I enjoyed, but there were some tropes around them or around their relationships that are just very personally like not for me. So I, I didn't have as much fun like spending time with them as I think we were supposed to. Um, yeah, they're just some things I didn't like about the way they're uh, their like cameos in the story were done. Um, and then I also really didn't like the romance element of this story and yeah, like I just, I really didn't enjoy it. This is like the third or fourth, maybe it's like the fifth thing I've read by this author now. And in a few of her other stories, there has been a romance with an age gap and that's something I usually don't like. But in all of the other cases, I was won over and I ended up really enjoying it. This is the only one where that I've read so far where it has actually felt like uncomfortable and I really didn't like it. Um, like I really didn't like the romance in this one, which is unfortunate because I tend to enjoy the way this author writes character romances and relationships. Um, but yeah, like, and I had other issues with the romance as well, but like a big part of it was just the age gap and how like it just didn't feel like that kind of relationship to me. And even though I got some inklings early on that that's where this might be headed, that still didn't make me enjoy it when we got there. So very mixed feelings about this one. I am glad I finished the series and um, like there were things I enjoyed about this, but this is definitely the least, my least favorite thing I've read from this author so far. And I gave the first chill of autumn 3.75 stars. Next, I finished on unnatural, an unnatural beanstalk by Brittany Fichter. This is the second in the Entwined Tales series, which is a group of fairy tale retellings that are all by different authors and they're not connected really at all, um, except that they're following siblings of the same family. Um, and this is a Jack and the Beanstalk retelling, as you can probably guess. And unfortunately, this one also ended up being a disappointment for me. Um, so we're following our main character, Eva, and she ends up being like blessed by their family's fairy godfather, which she's really unhappy about because he's not very good at his job. And um, this ends up giving her musical abilities that are actually magical. And she eventually gets kidnapped for those abilities. And then our other main character is Jack and he gets kind of brought into the story because Ava's fairy godfather realizes that he really messed up. <laughs> um, and so he kind of like pushes Jack into like meeting her and getting involved in like getting her out of there basically. Um, and there's other things that happen too. There's like some political stuff, but yeah, I, I was really disappointed in this one, especially because I was really enjoying it at the beginning. Like the first couple chapters, one or two chapters, I really liked. I was really loving the writing. I really liked Eva as a main character and I was just interested to see like where the rest of the story would go. Um, but after that, it was pretty much downhill because I... I just, I was really bored in this story first off. Um, like the plot just felt really dull and repetitive. There was a lot of like waiting around for stuff. And yeah, I also just like did not care about the romance at all. Um, like I liked Eva and Jack was fine, but like I really didn't feel any chemistry between them. So it was hard to be like invested in that part of the book, um, which is kind of one of the only things happening for most of it. Um, and I also hated the villain in this, like the way the villain was written was so frustrating and annoying because it felt like the author couldn't really decide what kind of villain he was supposed to be. Like, is he supposed to be ridiculous and comical and inept? Or is he supposed to be like actually scary? And it feels like she tried to do both and it just didn't work for me. Like, I don't know. There are, there are antagonists that can be like frightening in the way that they are both very evil and very like I don't know, silly about it. Uh, but that is not what this one read like to me. It just felt very confused and muddled. It's like he, he was so like ridiculous in the way he was characterized. And yet also he's apparently an actual murderer. It was just very strange. Like those things didn't fit. And it also didn't feel like it fit with the tone of the story. And then also there was another little thing about this that bothered me. And I don't, I don't think this is the intention of the author, <laughs> but the, the effect was not great. And that is that like Jack's mother is a horrible person. Like, I hate her as we are supposed to. Um, but it frustrated me that like sometimes the way other characters would talk to Jack and would react to him in like his home situation was basically like, what are you going to do, Jack? Listen to your mom some more. And 
the way, like, the reason that Jack shouldn't listen to her is not that he is an adult man and she is his mother and a woman. Um, the reason is that she's awful and does not have his or his sibling's best interests at heart. So, I don't know, it just, it felt a little bit like some of the characters were, like, kind of putting those things on the same level of, like, badness, and I don't think it was intentional, but that is still the feeling I got from this book, so I did not like that. Um, yeah, this was just really disappointing. I, like I said, I liked the writing, so I would try other things by this author, but this one really didn't work for me, and I gave un an unnatural beanstalk three stars also struggling to say that name, obviously. Next, I finished Miss Newbury's List by Megan Walker. This is a proper romance that I received as an ARC in exchange for an honest review, um, and the review I did is spoiler-free, so I will link that down below if you want more thoughts. Um, but we are following Rosalind Newbury as our main character, and she is getting ready to marry the Duke. Um, her family and her are really excited about this. She's, like, marrying up. This is something they've wanted for a long time, and um, Rosalind basically just has this summer of semi-freedom before she is a duchess and she has all of these expectations and her life is completely different. And so even though she is she is proud of what she's accomplished with this engagement, she is really like starting to panic a little bit about like how her life is going to change so completely and she doesn't feel like she's really done anything or had any adventures or um, even just done some of the things she wanted to. Um, a long time ago, one of her aunts inspired her to write down sort of like a bucket list um, of things that she wanted to do before she got married. Um, and so Rosalind digs out this list and decides that she's going to try and complete it, and that if she can do that, then she will feel like she's going into her new life having accomplished something and having done some things for herself. Um, she ends up recruiting the help of her best friend Liza, um, and also her best friend Liza's cousin, whose name is Charlie, um, who's kind of like the prodigal son who has come back and... Um, is possibly trying to reconcile with his family, and so the three of them end up spending a lot of time together as they try and help Rosalind complete her list, and in the process she starts really liking Charlie, and she is really, like, conflicted about this because obviously she is, you know, officially engaged to the Duke even though they barely know each other, um, and so that's, yeah, that's kind of the rest of the book. As I said, I have a whole review, so I won't get into this too much, but I really enjoyed it. Um, I really liked the romance and the characters, and, um, especially, like, a lot of the side characters, and then, of course, also our two leads. Um, I liked the way the family aspects were done, except for Rosalind's brother. I really didn't like him. Um, and I also really like that this book looks at a very, like, common trope, kind of, and, um, I don't know, it, it focuses a lot on, like, the emotional reality of what it would be like to go through what Rosalind is going through, um, and I also feel like it handled the romance really well, even though there is, again, that kind of questionable, like, possible cheating element. I've mentioned before that I am a lot more forgiving in historicals because women just didn't have many options, and a lot of times they weren't they weren't really consenting to their marriage in the first place, um, so I did want to mention that, but, like, I thought it was done really well. I think even if it's not a trope you usually like, you might still like the way this book does it. Um, and yeah, I just ended up really liking it, which is funny because the first little bit, the first few interactions that, like, conversations that, um, Rosalind and Charlie have, I was not a big fan of him. I didn't know how I was gonna feel, but I ended up really liking it, and I gave Miss Newbury's List four stars. Next, I finished The Boy Who Lost Fairyland by Catherine M. Valenti. Um, this is part of our Fairyland read-along that we are doing, me and my name is Marinez. Um, at the time I'm filming this, we haven't, uh, we haven't, like, scheduled this live show, but I will put that information in the description when we do, um, or the live show itself, if, if it's already happened by the time this goes up. This is the fourth book in the series, and it's kind of the weird one because it's more of a companion book. Um, September and our other main characters are barely in this one, and so we're actually following a young troll named Hawthorne, and he is a changeling. Um, so we're following him, like, he's, he's brought to the human world as a changeling, and we're, fo we're following him as he kind of ends up in fairyland again, and, um, yeah, I don't really know how to summarize it, but I loved this. This is, like, closely, like, it might be tied for my favorite. If it's not tied for my favorite in the series so far, it's a close second, um, because I, I don't know if I've mentioned this, like, officially in a video, but one of my favorite tropes of all time is, like, a changeling story where you're following the changeling and not the human child, like, you're following, like, the fairy child, um, and I don't talk about it a lot because a lot of times that's kind of a spoiler for books, so here it's not a spoiler and I can mention it, but I really loved that, and, like, I just, I felt for Hawthorne so much in his feelings of, like, not fitting in in either world. Um, I also really loved Tamberlene, who is a girl that he makes friends with, and I loved their friendship, and I really enjoyed, like, the world building and the adventures, and, um, the way, 
yeah, like I just, my heart just, I feel for these characters and I love them so much. Also, Blunderbuss, the, the wombat who's like made out of yarn and then like comes to life. Like, I adore her. I love and support Blunderbuss, the combat wombat with my whole heart. I just like, she's, she's amazing. Um, so anyway, yeah, I loved a lot of the characters, as you can see, and I really love the themes, as always. I enjoyed the writing, and as compared to the third book in the series, which wasn't my favorite, I think that the, like, whimsical aspects felt a lot better done in this book, and um, a lot less forced. So I just had a really wonderful time with this. Um, keep an eye out for our live show, but I gave The Boy Who Lost Fairyland 4.5 stars. Next, I finished Sea Sparrow by Kristen Kishore, and this was for another read-along that I am co-hosting, where I was since this was the last one, um, with Beautifully Bookish Bethany and a book fiend named Mel. I will link our live show down below. Um, this is the fifth and most recent book in the chain not Changeling. This is the fifth and most recent book in the Graceling series, and these two newer books um, feel like more of actual sequels, even though they are still kind of companion books in that we're following different main characters. Um, so I don't want to give too much away about, like, what this book is about or even, like, who it's about, um, or, like, kind of the setup for it, but I was very pleasantly surprised by this one because I was really nervous that this is a fairly long book that has two of my least favorite things in it, which are, like, ships or sailing and a survival story, but I was thankfully prepared for that because Bethany actually read this one first and was talking about it, so, like, I knew, so I, like, knew to prepare myself for those elements, um, and I also looked ahead to see how long those parts would last, like, the survival part especially, um, so there were a lot of reasons why I think I was set up for a better experience with this book than I might otherwise have had. It's still not my favorite in the series, but I did really enjoy it, even though it does have some big things that I don't like. And another big reason I think why I did still really enjoy this book is Hava, our main character. I freaking love her. Like, I am just... I love her so fiercely, and I was so invested in her story and in her healing, and just seeing her journey and seeing her, like, care about people and start to trust people. Like, I just, I just love her. I always love Kristen Kishore's main characters. Um, and I think I've said before, is like, every time I read a new book or reread, I'm like, maybe this one's my favorite. Maybe this one's my favorite. Um, so I, Hava might be my favorite protagonist so far as well. Uh, I just love her so much. And I really was, I really enjoyed, like, a lot of the side characters as well. There's one in particular who, I just, I really loved their interactions with Hava, and um, I did actually several. I really enjoyed, like, the different kind of relationships and, like, the messiness of those. I was also really impressed at the way that the, like, antagonistic characters are written, because they are, in some cases, like, horrible and, like, reprehensible, but you understand why they do what they did. And I also, this is something that Christmas Shore, I think, always does a fantastic job with, but she is so good at, like, no right answer or, like, no good choice situations where, like, there are things that can be true at the same time. Like, a character can hate what they're doing, something that they're doing can be ethically wrong, uh, like one of the main characters specifically, but then in the same time, it was the only choice or it was the best choice they had. Like, they are, they are hurting one person so that they can save a lot of other people, and, like, just, I think the, the way she deals with the messy ethics of that I think is just fantastic. Like, throughout the whole series, I've just been really impressed by that. There's also a little bit of a mystery element in this book that I really liked. I found very engaging, um, and I also really liked the political stuff in this one. Like, that happens near the end of the book. And I kind of alluded to this already, but the themes in this one are handled so well. Like, the way this book deals with trauma and healing and, like, caring for people and, like, love in many different forms is just something that I thought was so beautifully done. The only real negative I have is that, like, survival chunk. Uh, I think it was way too long. I think we could have gotten the exact same effect um, in much fewer pages, and I also just don't think, like, I don't understand why it was necessary because we had already had a, like, characters separated, thought dead, in other books in the series. We've already had a kind of, like, winter survival sequence in other books in the series, so it just felt, like, unnecessary. I think there were other ways that we could have accomplished the, like, character growth that happens there, but um, I think it's a testament to how well-written 
this this book is and how much I love like Kristen Kishore's characters and themes and everything because I still gave Sea Sparrow four stars even though there was that whole chunk where I'm like I don't like this get me out of here um but even in that chunk I just love Hava so much and I love her voice and I just was so invested in her and in her healing and in her caring for people and people caring about her that it even it pulled me through even the parts of the story that I wasn't enjoying as much so yeah four stars I I'm really impressed with like the last couple books in the series. These are the newer ones um, and I knew I loved the first three but this was my first time reading the most recent two that had come out and I understand why people were nervous about her continuing the series after so many years but I personally feel like these books really live up to that quality um, even though like I said this one is my least favorite in the series I still think it was done really well and I still feel like this series feels so cohesive even though there is such a long gap and I think that's very impressive. Next I finished The Bells of Paradise by Susanna Roundtree. Um, this is a really short novella that is um, in her fairy tale retold series which are not really, I don't think they're connected at all. I think it's just that um, they're all kind of like fairy tale or like folklore retellings and I can't remember, I guess this is like um, like a fair folk, like fairy fruit kind of thing. There might be a specific um, story that this is retelling and I just can't remember what it's called because I the main character is named John and he's a blacksmith and the woman he's in love with is named Janet and those names sound familiar to me um in terms of like a fairy story but anyway um yeah we're following John and his the woman that he loves is named Janet and she ends up getting she ends up straying too far into the woods like into the forest and um she gets taken by the fae and everybody basically tells John like that's it, man. Like, there's no hope. You can't go after her. She's lost to you forever. And John is just, like, a very ordinary person. He's not, like, an adventurer. He doesn't want to go into the forest, but he's like, well, I have to try. Um, and so that's kind of what the story is about. And I really liked this. I think the atmosphere is top-notch. Um, I always really enjoy Susanna Roundtree's writing, and I feel like her, the way she builds the setting and the feeling of this story is done so well. Um, I also really liked John as main character. I, I love those kinds of, you know, ordinary heroes. I love that. I really liked the way the folklore aspects were handled, like the fae and the fair folk. Like, I, I always say that with stories like this, it's a very, like, old world fair folk kind of feeling um, as opposed to some of the more modern interpretations of fae. And I also really enjoyed um, a lot of the side characters and the way their stories played out or were or were resolved. Um, there's one or two in particular that I really liked and even in such a short story I feel like um, they were written very well. The only thing that I didn't like so much were some aspects of the ending. I was kind of dreading where I thought things were going and even though I think like, I still wish it had been done differently, or I think it could have been done in a way that felt more satisfying to me. Ultimately, I, I actually didn't hate the ending. Like, I think it kind of made sense, and, like, it, it was pretty good. It could have been very good, but it was still pretty good. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed this. I gave The Bells of Paradise four stars. Next, I finished Olaju, The Edge of Origins, um, volume one, and this is by Peter Chizoba Daniel and Alexander Rudewerks Ighua. Um, I backed this as part of a Kickstarter. I think you might actually be able to buy this from regular bookstores now or soon, um, and I really, really enjoyed this. I have to show you guys, like, this art and the coloring is absolutely stunning. I think it's beautiful. Some of my favorite that I read in a graphic novel, um, and this is inspired by Igbo practices and culture, um, and we are following our group of main characters who are um, the Nikpuro Osisi, who are, it means tree people in the Igbo language, and we're following three of them who um, kind of make an unlikely uh, team or group of adventurers when they have to go on a sort of quest to um, like stop one of their own who has like turned against them and is trying to like take over the power of creation itself. Um, and I, I thought this was really well done. I found the story very compelling. As I said, I loved the art, and I also think the world building was done really well. Um, yeah, I just thought this was very well done. I really liked the cultural aspects and, like, um, kind of the ideas or the themes of the story, so I'm very excited to continue. And I gave The Edge of Origins 4.5 stars. Next, I finished A Royal Masquerade by Alison Thibault. Um, this is the second novella in a series, I can't remember. Tales of Ambia um, is what it's called, and this is a loose goose girl retelling. Um, and this is like a very funny book for me to rate because when I finished it, I gave it four stars, and I did really enjoy it. I really like her writing. Um, I think the way she translated the goose girl fairy tale and kind of made, like we're basically following like a side character 
in like that kind of story and she also the way she interpreted some things I thought was so clever and smart so um, I really enjoyed that part as well and I did also enjoy some of the humor even though some of it I didn't like so much but like I didn't actually love some of the characterization or a lot of the like plot things that happened so I don't know I don't have a lot to say about this one and what I do have to say is very confused <laughs> because like I overall really enjoyed it even if I'm like yeah I didn't really love some of the character stuff, didn't really love like the plot stuff, like really what I enjoyed a lot was the writing and like the fairy tale aspect. Um, and also there were some things that I think just could have been like handled better. So four stars maybe? I don't know. Um, and then finally the last book I finished in January is Beyond the Gender Binary by Alok Vaidmenon. Um, and this is a very short nonfiction book that is part of the Pocket Change Collective. And I've heard good things about these before, um, but the person who put this back on my radar is Leo Bancroft. Um, I will link him below. He was talking about this one and um, I am, I'm so glad I finally picked it up because I loved this. Um, I thought this was such a... it's like very concise and clear. Um, it, it's talking about the author's like experience being trans and being gender non-conforming so there's a little bit of that like personal element but it's also really great as like an introduction to some of these ideas um but i think even if you are already familiar with these concepts i think this is still a really valuable book because the examples the author uses and like the um the way that they phrase things i think is like just is very good and i think that can be something that um you can take away from this book even if the ideas are not new and i really love like the section at the back that is basically like different ways that um different ways that like the importance of trans rights are dismissed and trans identities are dismissed and some of the like um basically responding to like stereotypes or assumptions or um like reasons you know that uh that gender is just male or female and i thought that part was like so well done and like the author uses like so much information like science and like cultural norms and like all of these different sources to refute those very concisely but very thoroughly um and i'm just really impressed at how this book balanced like the memoir parts and the nonfiction parts and like the um, kind of fact-checking parts. It uses like research and data but also personal experiences. It's written very approachably but also very like thoughtfully and thoroughly. I just think this is a really fantastic well-done book that um, I think a lot more people should read um, even if you are familiar with some of these ideas. Um, yeah I thought this was great and I gave Beyond the Gender Binary five stars. Okay everybody so that was the rest of the books I read in January um, excepting a few that were part of my um, part of that like you know big secret collab which I will link again um, I know I talked about it last time but just in case you haven't seen it yet um, I will link my video and the whole playlist if you're interested in <laughs> seeing how good the Goodreads Choice Awards are actually for the last 10 years so let me know if you have read any of these books what you thought of them or if you're going to pick any up thank you guys so much for watching I will see you soon with another video and I hope you love the next book you read bye